to be here with me for this hopefully uh, good lecture course on super string theory this time we talked about string theory last summer and we covered mainly bosonic string theory in that to some extent of course right and well that was 24 28 hours of lecture so let us see how much time we can we can spend this time but uh, before i formally uh, begin physics uh, let me tell you let me first extend my heartfelt thanks to each one of you for being here with me i feel very privileged to have intelligence uh, intelligent audience and intelligent students like each one of you and i also extend my thanks to our common friend professor yuta kunj so yuta and each one of you have made me feel privileged to be here i mean talking to you some topics some ideas on string theory and super string theory okay so i welcome you all once again and with that we can now formally talk some physics so uh, i would in the first place actually you see string theory is a subject even when i uh, start my first few lectures on quantum field theory i need lot of background for for introducing field theory like you need some concepts in classical mechanics you need some concepts from special relativity you need covariant formulation of electrodynamics and then you little bit of non relativistic quantum mechanics and then relativistic quantum mechanics and then you make a transition to quantum field theory so going from discrete systems to the continuous systems with many infinitely many degrees of freedom that is what is field theory and so from uh, relativistic quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum field theory the main difference uh, it might be good to recap it this is the interpretation of the field in quantum mechanics you interpret it as a wave function and there are these equations like dirac equation planck gordon equation maxwell equation they are single particle wave equations and this uh, uh, we talk about the wave functions however when we make a transition to field theory then we start with a action with a lagrangian with a lagrangian density and then use the variational principle of classical mechanics obviously extended to quantum field theory to obtain the equations of motion and what you obtain which are the field equations so that becomes different than relativistic quantum mechanics right so plan gordon equation is the same as it looks in or dirac equation or maxwell equations they are identically the same as the look in relativistic quantum mechanics but then here the field phi or the spinner field psi they are fields quantum fields okay so that is the primary difference there and now when we think of going to string theory and then also to super string theory then there are many many more concepts which are needed and we need to recap and keep them in mind possibly forever all the time so we know what we know and what we want to know further so everything remains logical and we develop our concepts on a logical basis but then there are too many concepts okay so we can have a quick look at some of the key points okay why we need that what are we doing and so on so the first most important thing is four fundamental forces of nature and we can talk about the relative strengths 
So if I said the strength of the strong nuclear force to be equal to 1, then electromagnetic interaction would have 10 to the power minus 3 uh, B. Obviously, the most obvious of all of them, as soon as something falls out from my hand or from any mirror, it goes to the earth. Right? So, this is the most obvious force. However, this is the weakest among all these four. And now, supposing, I will not go into too much elementary concepts here, but Reminding ourselves about the relative strength of these forces is very important. What is happening that these first three, first three of these forces, they are combined into the relativistic quantum field theory. One of the most accurate theories of nature that we have known so far. And it is, it has been experimentally verified to several digits. Extremely well tested theory. And this takes care of these three strong electromagnetic and weak interactions. So these three interactions could be studied in a similar fashion within the framework of the relativistic quantum field theory. However, gravity is so obvious and so important falls out from this group and it cannot be studied in this group of the relativistic quantum field theories that so far. But we do know we can construct the field theory corresponding to gravity and then we can try to even quantize it. So here one is able to quantize these three consistently. Okay. So our, our aim would be to understand gravity theory and then possibly also construct the corresponding quantum field theory. So the main question and I think is need for as it is called QG quantum theory of gravity for short QG. So need for a quantum theory. This is what we would try to understand. Why do we need it? And how do we proceed to, to construct a consistent quantum field theory, quantum theory of gravity. Okay. I would I would gradually differentiate also in the quantum field theory of gravity and quantum theory of gravity. The two you will find according to my understanding, uh, I will I will I will tell you how these two are different. Okay. So uh, perhaps we could remind ourselves about Mr. Newton and Mr. Einstein for in the context of gravity theory. You see, before we know what is a quantum theory of gravity, what could be the correct quantum theory of gravity, we need to understand classical theory of gravity. So, Classical, even Newton's theory is classical, even Einstein's theory is classical. But then, what is the difference in the two? Newton's theory is not a field theory. Newton's theory of gravity is not a field theory of gravity. 
However, Einstein's theory of gravity, which we call a general relativity, is a field theory. It's a classical field theory of gravity and extremely, uh, extremely well understood. You people are experts on this already. And we know that this uh, Einstein's gravity, which we call as general relativity, so general relativity is a very extremely successful theory. And it describes the physics at large scales. Physics of the universe, physics of the solar system, physics of the neutron stars, physics of the boson stars, physics of black holes, physics of wormholes, all large distance physics. And very accurately, very nicely. And here, I forgot to tell you the, the main key point between these two. So, what happens? If I have these two masses I hold in my hand with masses M1 and M2 at some distance R1, I change this R1 to R2. What happens according to Mr. Newton and what happens according to Mr. Einstein? According to Mr. Newton, as soon as I change R1 to R2, the force given by M1 M2 by R square changes instantaneously without any loss of time. However, Mr. Einstein tells us, no, 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 this is not possible, this is incorrect. Why? Because nothing is allowed to move faster than light, including the gravitational signal. So gravitational signal, the carrier of the gravitational force, we call as graviton, which is a spin to particle, Last year we had even derived it in the spectrum of the bosonic string theory and we would recap all those things again but so graviton is a spin to particle and it's the carrier of the so each one of these interactions has some carrier of the force okay and for example here it is it is the uh, photon here they are gluons, here W plus minus and G0 for B and here Z. Okay. So these are the force carriers and we know about 12 uh, matter particles. So So you know six quarks and six leptons and like up, down, charge, strain, beauty and top, you, you know six quarks and six leptons, electron, muon, tau on and electronic neutron, no, tauonic neutron, no, muonic neutron, no, right? So these are the 12 fundamental particles but then these are the force carriers apart from yet another X which has already been experimentally discovered. So these are all the, the fundamental particles and here like, uh, like these interactions, gravitational interaction also has a carrier of force which is graviton. Just to illustrate that if, if we consider uh, supposing you consider the motion of two electrons without a field theory description they would interact with, with each other depending upon their strength of charges okay how much charge they have so one might deflect the other and so on what happens quantum mechanically is One guy emits a photon and the other guy absorbs it. Okay? So this is quantum mechanical description of the same phenomenon, electrodynamics. And if you describe it in terms of this, 
you call this as QED, quantum electrodynamics. And this is the simplest of all the three theories. And therefore, often we take examples from the QED theory. Now, so Mr. Einstein has tells us that if two masses M1 and M2, if they were to interact, so they would also talk to each other via the exchange of a gravity. So this is it. And then you develop the field theory of gravity. So Einstein's theory of gravity, which we call a general relativity, is the field theory of gravity. Of course, classical field theory of gravity, because quantum field theory you obtain when you quantize the field. Right? So this is uh, just to remind, and these force carriers for the strong interactions are A to gluons. For the weak interactions, they are W plus minus and G0. All of these things are well known, experimentally discovered, various Nobel prizes, everything. So these are well established uh, facts. So here, M1 and M2, they also now supposing. I want to do a thought experiment, which is very, very important, such a simple idea, but very deep in concept. So what we do, supposing I consider two masses, M1 and M2, and I calculate the gravitational force between the two, they are sitting at a distance r, so M1 M2 uh, by R square, the force between the two, and of course, you have the Newton's gravitational constant. Supposing I also calculate the electrostatic force or electromagnetic force between the two, then this is your Q1, Q2 by R square you can easily find out that this is 10 to the power 36. And this is what actually also means here, the, the ratio of this one and this one is 10 to the power minus 36. And a special theory of relativity tells me the... So let me consider a proton. So rest mass of the proton times C square, mass energy equivalence, a special theory of relativity tells us already. So, if I accelerate this, if I consider uh, two protons, they, here the two protons are sitting at rest. Okay, at some distance r, and then this is the situation. However, if I accelerate them, and let me say I accelerate them to 10 to the power 18 times mp times c square 10 to the power 18 times rest mass of the proton times c square. So, what will happen in this situation? In this situation, this ratio of gravitational force by electrostatic force would be 10 to the power 36 times 10 to the power minus 36 is of the order of 1. You see? So it's a simple thought experiment but with a very rich physics content. Now, whatever particle physics, whatever things we know so, so far, whatever our large hadron collider or our experiments at Deji or at Fermilab, whatever they tell us, they conform or they are consistent with the idea that gravitational force is so big that you neglect it completely. But now, under this situation, this will no longer be the case. Things would change completely. So, you see, if you, if you 
if you accelerate things to 10 to the power uh, 20, mp into c square 10 to the power 20 mp into c square. You see now even the strong force would be as strong, uh, even uh, the, the gravitational force would be even as strong as the strong interaction force. And it would then become even stronger than, than these forces, other two forces. You see, scenario would completely change. Now, nobody knows the outcome of this experiment, one can think about it, but experimentally you just cannot simply handle it because we are far below this range in all our experiments that are being carried out so far, uh, led by LHC at CERN, they are way below this, far, far below this, nowhere comparable. So we have no idea, but then this idea is extremely rich and important and one cannot ignore this, okay? So one has to think about it. What would happen if gravity were also to be taken into account? So you can't take it uh, lightly, you have to take it very, very seriously. So this is one strong motivation for why we make these uh, I will make these efforts all the time. Let me before I rub off these things, I would like to eventually after some time when we know a little bit about bosonic string theory then this point would again be important that all these matter particles are Fermi particles. Six quarks and six electrons are Fermi particles with half integer spin. Okay? These are spin by half particles. And the bosonic string theory deals only with bosonic particles. In the spectrum you have only bosons, right? So bosons could be uh, including a photon is a boson and uh, gluons, gravitons, they are all bosons. Okay? All gaze, therefore they are called vector gaze bosons. But not vector, it could be yes, okay. So this because the, the gauge boson for gravity is a dancer. Okay. For electromagnetic field it's a vector, right? So they are called uh, gauge bosons. Okay? So these they are gauge bosons, they are bosons. So with integral is okay? Zero, one, two. So uh, graviton is a spin two, photon is a spin one, and so okay? All right, so this we will come to, uh, and this only tells us that eventually super string theory which talks about fermions as well as bosons is indeed the, could indeed be the correct theory. And bosonic string theory, of course, as it was modern, you can understand it, develop techniques and so on, but it is away from reality because the spectrum would not contain, never contain fermions. Okay? So fermions are also to be, to be considered. Okay? Alright, so <coughs> now uh, we would, uh, we will often or we should always come back to this question because our, our aim is to understand the need for a quantum theory of gravity. This is the main theme of my introductory talk today. Why do we need a quantum theory of gravity? So, uh, for, for trying to understand this need, we have to in the first place try to see, try to understand what is quantum field theory and how it works. And where does it have limitations in the context of gravity? Okay, and what are these limitations? And how can one take care of them? That is actually uh, referred to as the renormalization theory. 
So renormalization theory is very important to understand uh, how it works in field theory and how uh, how uh, would it work in gravity theory if we were to construct a perturbation theory for gravity theory just in analogy with the our conventional quantum field theory which we, which, uh, which talks about these first three fundamental forces of nature. Okay? Right. So, uh, there are various uh, uh, various ways to, to look for the to look for the uh, necessities or motivations or our aims that we want to do this and we are not able to do this. Why can't we do this? So, uh, let me let me briefly tell you uh, is little bit uh, uh, about I mean uh, classical theory of gravity. Okay, classical or let me call classical field theory of gravity. Okay, classical field theory of gravity, which is our general relativity. But some some point that I I wish to highlight is uh, one thing is how do we how do we get to it in the very first place? How do we get to it? So uh, and then so let me let me talk about Pythagoras theorem. Okay, let me start with that and let us see what is the difference in field theory or classical field theory of gravity with the classical field theory of other three forces. Okay? The conventional field theory. So, what is the situation? Let me talk about the uh, metric tensor and let me talk about the E2 space. This is what we have been learning right from the school that ds square is dx square plus dy square. Very special case. Just only equality in space. You consider two, two lines perpendicular to each other. A square of this plus a square of this is sum of this. A square of this uh, <coughs> diagonal term. So dx square plus dy square. Is. Now let me write it down for This is the E3 space and I am talking about the Euclidean coordinates x, y, z. So E3 space. Let me now generalize it to uh, dz square. So this is E4 space. And now, let me have W equal to ICT, the big rotation, usually you, you write, uh, you go from Minkowski space to the Euclidean space, then you have minus, okay? So, if you do that, then this will go to minus c square dt square plus dx square plus dy square plus dz square. Okay. And this would be my m4 space. Okay? Four dimensional Minkowski space. So I am still talking about the length square of the length of the diagonal, right? So this is in a four dimensional space with one coordinate at ICT. Okay? Now, you people are doing gravity theory, you could as well write it as in the spherical coordinates, spherical coordinates, 
R square D theta square plus R square N square theta D square. So we, we are still in the M We are still in the M for space. Now what I want to do is I want to you see we are going generalizing our things bit by bit from E2 space we go to E3 space, then to E4 space, then we go to uh, M4 space, and we are still now in the M4 space. Now what I do is I multiply these things by some coefficients. So minus times let me call A, and this let me put x nu here plus dr square times b of x mu plus r square d theta square into c of x mu plus I r square sin square theta d phi square into d of x mu. Here my x mu could be could be t r theta pi or it could be t or you can say c t. Okay. So c t x by x depending upon what kind of coordinate system you are using. Now this brings us to a very interesting point. In the first place, what I have done in my metric tensor, right from the beginning, I have I have put to zero all the off-diagonal elements. What it means is the meaning is very simple. Here dx and dy they are perpendicular so it's a two dimensional space including space and your metric tensor would be gij is gij is 1 0 0 1 for a three dimensional space this would be 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 okay and so on so here it would be minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. By putting to 0 all these off diagonal elements, I have simply simplified this. So this is not a very general. This is not the most general value of the metric tensor, but it's only a when we come to to M4 space, we start putting it, let us say G mu of G mu equal to, to this. And it's just to differentiate the Euclidean space with the Minkowski space, we you can use Roman letters IJ and here you can use Greek letters G mu nu. In principle, you can take the, them to be non-valency. But then the axis would no longer be orthogonal, but they would be oblique. Okay, the axis would be oblique everywhere. But if I put the octagonal elements to be zero, then they are orthogonal to each other. But my main point that I want to derive is now here in the last step here, I want to have a, b, c, d. So. Uh, then, uh, let me let me take eta mu nu or g mu nu does not matter by whatever name you call it. A, B, C, and D. So all these elements are. all the off-diagonal elements I have put to zero. Now, 
if these A, B, C, D are constant, like one, okay, then we have a flat space. And then these A, B, C, D are functions of x mu, they depend on the space-time variables, then the, the, uh, then the, the space is no longer flat, but the space is curved. Space is curved. So you see, as soon as you go beyond M for a space, what we have done is we have made a, we have made a big transition. This we were still talking about until this step, we were still talking about spatial relativity and the Minkowski space. Okay? But now this is you can say it's a it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a curved space time this metric tensor so it's a Riemannian space but Riemannian space but with a Lorentzian signature okay so Riemannian space even I mean you you don't have to make uh, bring in the time into this for Riemannian space it could all be x y z and so on Euclidean or Minkowski but the so if you take one of them like that, then this is a Riemannian geometry. So we have gone from Euclidean geometry to Minkowski geometry to Riemannian geometry. Okay? And here, so this last step is the right one to describe gravity because it's a curved manifold. So very often you find in the books some statements like Gravity is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. This precisely is uh, this last equation, last step, last relation for the value of gs square. This precisely tells us that that gravitation or gravitational force or whatever you like to call it, uh, gravitation is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time manifold. So as soon as you make A, B, C, D, etc. as fixed, constant, gra gravity would disappear, curved manifold would now become a flat manifold and there would be no gravity. Okay. So this was just for a very, very elementary illustration. We can, we can put it in a, uh, put it in a little more sophisticated form. So, like, uh, if you like Jimmy mu nu or if you like eta mu nu as you like, dx mu dx nu. Now, this could be uh, And this, let me say, as fixed. Now, no gravity. Here, the this is a flat. space-time manifold and this is a curve space-time manifold. Here, now I need not restrict it to be a diagonal. It's not necessary. You can have all kinds of things. You, you, you very often consider rotations of the rotational black holes or neutron stars or whatever. You automatically have some, some terms which are of diagonal terms. Okay, so uh, in general this would be a, in a, in a four dimensional space this, this would be a four by four. 
matrix. So it will have 16 components. Okay? You can have all of them not zero, you can have off diagonal to be zero as you like. You can simplify your life and therefore you have lots of mod mod of, kind of modern building and so on. So with this we have fairly good idea. This is very important. So when we have this uh, G mu nu, which is a function of x mu, then actually this G mu nu itself becomes a field. Okay? Because it depends on x mu. Right? Now, <coughs> one more point we need to uh, recap in this context is apart from this, after we know this, we know classical field theory of gravity relatively better. Right? With this clarification, we know the classical field theory of gravity at a better scale. Okay? So now, one more point, which is, to, to my mind, is very crucial, and this has to do with the potential energy, phi of x. This is minus gm by x. Is very, very well known. Okay. Now, what I want to show is, supposing I want to plot it. Okay, let me just make one dimensional. Phi of x minus gm by x. So, mod x could be plus one. Okay. As usual. Now, let us try to have a plot of this. So let me let me let me have this at in some units equal to one. Okay? Then I would also have somewhere minus one. Okay. Now here I would like to consider plot of phi of just for illustration purposes, here this is would be the definition of the potential potential energy phi at a point x generated by a mass m which is sitting at the origin. So let let it sit here at the origin. Alright. Now put just g equals to one. So what you have is minus m by mod x. This would be, uh, so this mod x for me is plus minus 1 and minus m. Now, if you consider, uh, if you consider, I have taken it too far. So, I should have taken a smaller screen maybe. One I have taken too far, maybe I should take a smaller. So, uh, something like this would be joining. I am not interested in the real nature of this, okay, here. What I want to say, when I take m equals to 2, this line remains here, but it goes here. If I make m equals to 4, it goes twice of this height. If I make m equal to 100, this point goes far above. So what happens, what I want to, what I want to really tell is that, some mass m1 and so you can you can you can draw a supposing this is the event horizon I, I, I just come back to this what it is so the heavier the mass the deeper the singularity this is one Point that I want. The heavier the mass, 
the deeper the singularity. So supposing we consider our sun, for example, a protostar, and we consider a black hole sitting here, which is some millions times heavier than our uh, our sun, then this I would be I would not be even able to depict it by any diagram. Okay, how deep it would go. So this is obviously a singularity. So I want to come back to the singularity, idea of singularity. Now, because we are going to encounter them and so let me make some space here. And let me write this expression for the this is or let me call it small r. So this can tell me v square is 2gm by r or r equal to 2gm by e square. Now, uh, <coughs> here we want to pick up a very elementary idea from the school level that there is a mass m, it has some radius r, for example earth, and we can calculate the escape velocity for earth, and this is something like 11.2 uh, kilometers per second. Okay. Now, I again do a simple thought experiment. I want to keep m to be fixed, but I want to reduce r. What will happen as I reduce r, keeping m fixed? That I will reach a limiting value where this is equals to c square or when this becomes equal to c square at that point so the velocity becomes comparable to the velocity of light that is a little bit smaller than the velocity of light then this object of mass m would turn into a black hole right so and then this value of r would actually correspond to the so-called swap cell radius of the object. So for our earth, if I could keep the mass of the earth to be the same, fixed, and if I keep reducing the radius, and I make it 8.4 millimeter, our earth would become black. Our sun, if I reduce it and put it, squeeze it into a, uh, into a, object of radius 3 kilometers, it would become a black hole. But this simple calculation would tell us. So, and then this value of r would correspond to something called as the Schwarzschild radius. And more generally, you talk about event horizon. So, you know the event horizon is an imaginary surface and a unidirectional membrane where things can only go in and nothing can come out. Okay, So from here we get an idea and this is part, I should have told this idea first and this idea later. So here there is the event horizon uh, uh, and nothing can enter, uh, nothing can come out of it. Right? So for a black hole nothing can come out of the event horizon, so it's a unidirectional membrane things can go in, 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 but nothing can come out. So, now the point here was that the heavier the mass, gravitating mass, the deeper the singularity. So, you see, we are trying to address some singularities. Well, the most obvious singularity is if we, if we run our universe backwards in time we hit upon a singularity called as the Big Bang, right? This is another kind of singularity that we encounter for black holes. And 
even inside the black holes you have the singularity. So we have been talking about our classical theory of gravity, classical field theory of gravity, we are able to construct. And how much is the limit for this classical field theory of gravity that explains to us is this is the limit. So it explains us all physics, beautifully, wonderfully, largest in physics. But beyond event horizon, it breaks. So classical theory of gravity, which we call a general relativity, will break down beyond the event horizon limit. It cannot explain things further. And so this is, as at the beginning, our one of the main questions was need for a quantum theory of gravity. Need for This is, uh, we are trying to address gradually what is the need for a quantum theory of gravity, okay? So, you see what happens, even though general relativity is extremely uh, predictive, very correct, but it has limitations. So, the just example that I mentioned, like you, if you run the universe backwards in time, then you hit upon a singularity called as the Big Bang. And near that point, your general relativity would break down and you would need further some to explain things, understand things correctly, you would need a quantum theory of gravity. And you see, even black holes are also not eternal they also eventually decay away. So, the radiation that comes out does not carry any information. So, it seems that the information as to what once made a black hole might be getting destroyed in the process. Okay? And then, but this will then class with the unitarity of quantum mechanics. This would be inconsistent with the unitarity principles of quantum mechanics. So, this is one major point which uh, more than 40 years ago uh, led Stephen Hawking to say that now we need to modify our laws of quantum physics in order to understand gravity. So if you want to understand gravity, you need to modify quantum laws. Now we know a little bit about, in our way, that is important for us, the classical field theory of gravity. And we gradually have also started coming to know, realizing what are the limitations, why we need a further quantum theory of gravity. So you see, they, if you go deeper into these singularities, your general relativity beyond event horizon would not explain the things. So, we look for a quantum theory of gravity. Now, can we construct a quantum theory of gravity? Can we construct a quantum field theory of gravity? In the usual way that we do in field theory or the conventional field theory. So, uh, there is uh, uh, let me tell you again we will have to go to for for the the main problem that we say is that the quantum field theory of gravity if we construct it on par with the quantum field theory of other three forces is not renormalizable. What does it mean? We have to understand this, we have to try to understand this. What does it mean? For the simplest example we can think of is QED. QED is the simplest example. So let us take QED as an example. Uh, so in QED there are four
these are four and four eight diagrams. These are the lowest order or first order Feynman diagrams of QED theory, and they are the fundamental diagrams. For QED theory, you have eight and only eight, no less, no more. Similarly, for other theories, you have certain fundamental first order diagrams. Okay, for electronic theory, for QCD theory, and if I would construct a quantum field theory of gravity, I would have similarly some fundamental vertices here, what is happening, let us say an electron is going like this or like this, or so let us say a pair creation or a pair annihilation or a scattering of an electron or a scattering of a positron. So first few could be, you can think that with the emission of a photon, then you have four, or with the absorption of a photon. So four and four, eight. Okay? Pair creation, pair annihilation, electron is scattering, positron is scattering with the emission of a photon or with the absorption of a photon. So now you make all higher order diagrams in the QED theory making use of the fundamental vertices of the theory. Fundamental diamond diagrams of the theory. So these are eight diagrams in QED theory and you can construct other diagrams out of this and you can then calculate the transition amplitude or the transition probability for any occurrence of any theory. So for example, you consider, let us say, electron-electron scattering. And so, you see, the diagrams that I made actually like this, it could also be, it, it means the same because they are topologically equivalent, okay? So there is nothing in the, in the, in the angles and directions, there is just a line and this is yet another line. To differentiate the two, a solid line is representing the fermions and this baby line is representing the photon. Okay? So, <coughs> so, so basically you cut the two, then this is one vertex, this is another vertex, three vertices. And if you join the two, you get the so-called tree-level diagram. This is the tree-level diagram of the NQVD theory for a electron-electron scattering or a positron-positron scattering. Okay? All right. And uh, now, uh, in, I can consider another theory, another, another diagram. So this is, this is complex. Electron. And a photon. Okay. So this also, as you can see, if I cut it from here, this is one fundamental vertex. This is another fundamental vertex of QED, and I can I can construct this. So these are three three level diagrams in. These are the three level diagrams in the QED theory for a Compton scattering or a electron scattering. Now, in each one of the theories like QED, QCD, electronic theory, there are some fundamental diagrams, lowest order radiative corrections. In a way, I am actually trying to recap in a nutshell, in a, in a brief amount of time what one teaches in quantum, advanced quantum field theory. Okay? But you take the example of QED because that is simpler to understand. So uh, now there are 